Sami Zerker mentioned the fact that uh, Abdel Fakih and I had in his mind four pillars for Judaism. And from what I learned today, I can tell that he himself is a pillar of humanity. And people like Abdel Fakih and I probably make this world a better place for all of us. So, uh, very interesting personality, and I'm very glad that we had the opportunity. It's not, that's better. Very glad that we had the opportunity to uh, talk about his work, about his thinking, about his thoughts, about his about all the, the things he did in his lifetime. I just want to take this opportunity before we go on to uh, thank again Professor Kranz, the indefatigable Professor Kranz, who really worked hard, labored very hard days and nights to make this happen. And of course, all the staff of CRTR, the staff of all of them have worked hard, but the dynamo behind this whole conference is Professor Kranz, and thank you again for the opportunity. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce now the panelists, and we're supposed to have four of them, but one of them could make it, and so Professor Kranz will read his paper, I'll mention soon who he is. To start with, Professor Sharon Portnoff. I'll introduce all of them at the beginning, and then they'll be uh, making their presentations. Sharon Parnoff is Associate Professor of Religious Studies at Connecticut College. She holds degrees from St. John's College, Annapolis, Harvard University, and the Jewish Theological Seminary. She is the author of Reason and Revelation, Before Historicism, Strauss and Falkenheim, University of Toronto, 2011, and co-editor of the companionship books, Essays, in honor of Lawrence Burns, Lexington, 2012, and Emil L. Falkenheim, philosopher, theologian, Jew, published real, her most recent articles are Not in Our Stars, Primo Levi's Reve, and Dante's Purgatorios, Idealistic Studies, and Interdisciplinary Journal of Philosophy, and a few more, and Reactive Humanism, If This is a Man of Primo Levi's, New Bible, The Value of Particular Lessons from Judaism, and Modern Jewish Experience. This is the most recent article, I guess, that was published in 2015. So, long list of publications. That's Sean Portnoff. The next presenter will be Mr. Peter Margo. Peter Margo is a member of the National Board of CIGR. Peter has a personal experience. His parents were friends with the Falkenheim family. And I would say that this panel actually will basically talk more about personal experiences that uh, the presenters had with the meal personal basis, either students or with family. So Peter will talk more, more, more about the family aspect of uh, getting to know Emil Falkenheim and his family. And then the third presenter, who is not with us, is Professor Edward Alexander, who was mentioned before, who published the book, The Jews Against Themselves, and a letter by him will be read by Professor Kratz, the third presenter. Then the fourth and last presenter, will be Professor Victor Shefford, who will talk about the topic is Emil Falkenheim, gratitude for the gift he was. And I'll just speak uh, to, uh, actually I could say a few words also about uh, Peter. Peter was, uh, came to Canada with his parents and sister from Berlin on October 8, 1937, under somewhat different circumstances from Emil Falkenheim. Peter says that he became rapidly Canadianized. He's going to tell you his story. He got his BA from Bishop's University, and then he went on to graduate work at the University of Toronto, but uh, had to leave mid-studies for his family business. And uh, Peter is, uh, again, as I said, a respected member of our, very respected member of our board. I just have to say that Peter says, that the charisma or, or Professor, uh, Professor Emil Falkenheim had a transformative experience or, or influence on him. And that's, that's what we are hearing today, that whoever came in contact with Professor Falkenheim, Emil Falkenheim, was very much affected by his personality, by his wisdom, and Peter is one of them. Then Professor Shefford was a student of uh, Professor Falkenheim, undergraduate and graduate studies as well. And uh, 
just to read a short uh, bio. He's a graduate of the University of Toronto, MA Philosophy and BD, PhD of the, in Theology from Emmanuel College. Currently teaches at Tyndale University College and Seminary, as well as at Trinity College, the University of Toronto. He's a former student of Emil Fakenheim. Mr. Shepard has continued to probe the thought of Emil Fakenheim, as well as the discussion that his work is precipitated in philosophy and in Jewish self-understanding. Mr. Shepard speaks frequently in churches, synagogues, and schools on the history of Christian anti-Semitism. So without further ado, I'd like to invite the first presenter, Mr. Sportloff. Generations, 
which they did or should love. I was graciously included in a Shabbat dinner at his son David's home. Fackenheim told me he wanted me to meet his grandchildren so that I would know what keeps him alive. He told me he had come to understand the connection between philosophy and grandchildren through watching his grandson, then a year and a half old, push a table to the window to climb up and look out. As Fackenheim understood it, his grandson had first decided that he wanted to look out the window, then figured out how to accomplish that. The child's thinking, in other words, grew out of his human need, which served as the beginning, not the end, of his quest. Thinking brings us to the beginning of knowing, to the looking out, not to answers, but to questions. To safeguard the thinking, indeed the humanity of future generations, Fackenheim believed, we must pass down the fruits of our thinking, even as our thinking remains open to what those who come after might see from their own windows. Now I have tried to formulate this very carefully, the passing down of the fruits of our thinking, even as our thinking remains open to what those who come after might think. Because much is contained in what we mean by the phrase passed down. The most pressing question in our understanding of Fackenheim is the extent to which he believed that all thinking is or must now be informed by what is passed down, or whether, as I will argue, he left open the possibility that some thinking takes place beyond history, so to speak, and that there are some things that are permanent. Surely his conviction that the same God that appeared at the Red Sea in Sinai may continue his existence during and after the Holocaust points to this possibility. So too, in his work as a philosopher, Fackenheim adopted an openness that might include the possibility of contemplative thought, which arises from the permanence of certain questions at the heart of what Strauss calls the mystery of being. It is not the contemplative thought Fackenheim passed down to his students and descendants, but rather the openness. The question, and Fackenheim's particular contribution to Jewish post-Holocaust thought, is how to get from the stance that informs all our thinking with our most pressing, cur pressing current needs to thinking which is rooted in permanence. If what I am suggesting is correct, that Fackenheim was open to the possibility of returning to questions understood as permanent, why did he not simply affirm the Jewish God, the covenant, and the people Israel? Why take the detour through his particular form of religious existentialism? Why not, like Uber, posit an eclipse of God during the dark years of the Holocaust? Why not, like Strauss, return directly to the way those questions were asked at the outset of the philosophical tradition? Why not return directly to Plato? Indeed, when we spoke, he formulated the distinction between Strauss's thought and his own as the return to Plato versus the return to Hegel, for whom, as Fackenheim put it, becoming includes history. That is, for whom ideas are passed down in an historical process that impels and answers human need. The living answer to this is, I think, that for Fackenheim, returning to the affirmation of permanence, be it to the Jewish God or Platonic philosophy, without a shocked pause, an acknowledgement of the unprecedented evil, is a form of escapism. To live morally serious lives, we must directly encounter the radical evil of the Holocaust, its unprecedented nature. And this encounter requires us not to think it through. Indeed, Fackenheim held that the events of the Holocaust cannot and should not be rendered rational but to know its facticity in our bones. These events really happened, and really happened to Jews in particular, and to be morally serious, we must, take, we must face the possibility that God, that permanence, permanence itself, does not exist. So the first answer to why Fackenheim, at least to, st to some extent, informs all thought with human need and situates its results and is, as an historical unfolding is that I believe that we, we must not shy away from the facts of the Holocaust. The genocide happened to a particular people in a particular moment, and Jews must, as he put it, return into history. Human need in the post-Holocaust moment was what was most urgent, and Jewish return was necessary not only for Jewish survival, one might argue, as some have, that Fackenheim prioritized survive, Jewish survival so highly as to eradicate the specificity of Jewish content 
but also so that Jews might inform Christians of the dangers of what he called their religion's Constantinianism, its positing of its own supersessionism, which subsumes and erases what comes before. Returning to Hegel was, in other words, after reflection, what was most prudent. But this is not the only answer. Prudence might, conversely, point to things that are not passed down, to things which may not be expedient, but to which possibility one aspires. Surely the act of Jews returning into history to mend the world is an act of hope beyond what in the immediate post-Holocaust moment seemed possible. But Judaism, as Fagenheim understood it, is a living religion, a religion that must be open to the moments in which its adherents live if it is to remain relevant. And living includes moments of joy, and here we get to the heart of what I want to tell you about Fackenheim and what I think he wanted us to know. What we think is passed down can be passed down only in the form of ideas or of technique or methodology. We cannot pass down the joy that comes from knowing things. To put this in biblical terms, and this is something Fackenheim following the rabbis teaches in, in what is Judaism, his book, the Torah is given when one receives it. That is, each and every Jew alive then and in the future was at Sinai. For us, Fackenheim's students, to continue to live and to think, to be open to all life's possibilities, we must be open also to the joy that broadens and enriches what we know. When I knew him, Fackenheim was a joyful man. He had by then given up his cigars and liquor, but told jokes often. One might be surprised by this. I mean, especially after seeing the video, he's very uh, serious, but joy, the seriousness included his joy, I would argue. Someone who had attended so uprightly to the facticity of the Holocaust could yet be a not infrequent joke teller and have an all around joie de vivre. Those who knew him, I think, can confirm this. But I am suggesting that he could be joyful because even as he took seriously his moment in history, he remained open to the possibilities implicit in relationships and in living itself. In other words, Fackenheim held the conviction that the, that the foundations of post-Holocaust thought, to be moral, that is, to reflect our humanity, must be rooted in that particular historical circumstance, and also the conviction that there are things beyond that circumstance, things that make us laugh, and that hold the promise of answers to our most pressing questions. Even while Fackenheim spoke often of the long cast of Hitler's shadow and our necessary commitment to that historical moment, he found himself also in a moment filled with possibilities for transcendence from that moment. Now what I am suggesting here is that Fackenheim invites us to read him as an historically conscious thinker. That is to say, he invites us to read him as a thinker whose thought is not disconnected from the Holocaust. To what extent the content of his thinking stands as perennially true is not my concern here. Rather, my concern is to what extent he invites us, so to speak, to move beyond his thinking. Does the facticity of the Holocaust now, paradoxically, remain the new grounding of our thought? Does the facticity of the Holocaust at some point lose priority over other historical circumstances, and so no, no longer mandate that its events be the root of our thinking? This may have been the heart of the question about other genocides. I want to suggest something more profound. Fackenheim provides the tools whereby historical consciousness itself at some point may end, and a return to thinking rooted in permanence is both rationally and morally Fackenheim's affirmation of the precedence of the facticity of the Holocaust as the new perpetual root of our thinking was strong, grounded in his conviction that its events were unique to human history and created ruptures in philosophy, Judaism, and Christianity, which, to be mended, had to find new roots in living to begin their regrowth. So, for instance, when he first began to write about the Holocaust after years of what he regarded as his own escapism from it, he looked first to how the Jewish community in North America was actually living in its aftermath, and then formulated an additional commandment focused on Jew Jewish unity and survival. And yet he told me he regretted having formulated the 614th 
later, as, as uh, Professor Green told us, he developed it into the commanding voice of Auschwitz. I imagine that his regret had less to do with its content than that he became famous only for it, and consequently the motion of his thinking was thwarted. His thinking, in other words, was given content, an answer provided, and my suspicion is that he was less concerned with the fame that came to him than with the way in which his fame for this one single contribution closed off the possibilities implicit in the radical openness of his thought. And this probably goes back to Professor Morgan's uh, suggestion that we really have to read all of him and read him seriously as a, a philosophical thinker. Right now, philosophy, Judaism, and Christianity are ruptured and require new, require new soil to regrow. But this does not mean that one cannot return to the richer soil their beginnings. His thinking rooted itself in the Holocaust, yes, but Fackenheim was unwilling to provide ultimate answers. This was the heart of his openness, and it was something he passed down to me. Through his example, he gave me permission to move past the Holocaust, that is, to get beyond it as our most pressing need, by exemplifying the full embrace of the joys of living. He showed me that morality is best expressed as living in awareness of the full range of human need, in order both to reflect the image of God and to show kindness to a visitor to Jerusalem studying Heidegger. Paradoxically, then, responding to the Holocaust itself makes possible the reaffirmation of the permanence of our inability to know the whole. Let me spell out a little more simply what I mean. Fackenheim taught me that in fully engaging with life and with the full range of human possibility, we may find joy even in the worst of times. It is up to us to choose that joy and the hope implicit in it to make meaning where there is none. But the choosing of hope is not an end. It is a guiding principle for the work we are in. We choose the work of mending the world even though there seems to be proof that there is no hope in the events of the Holocaust. But in choosing hope, we do not flee the less sanguine realities of our existence. Fackenheim's work and his living were largely involved in guiding those who read him and those who knew him not to choose idealism. He saw escapism in ancient philosophy's preference in contemplation of the good over mending the world. So not to choose idealism, but instead, through living the right kind of life, an upright, joyous life, to find indeed to make the hope we so desperately need. I am reminded here of a story Fackenheim told me about his son, and I'm not sure which son it is, but you'll tell me if it's about you, who, when he was four, said to his father, and I'm paraphrasing the first part of this, what's so great about God? He only created the world. <laughs> Superman fights evil. <laughs> While Fackenheim's approach, as I am describing it, echoes traditional Jewish strategies of coping with catastrophe, Going, back as far, as going as far back as Jeremiah, his favorite prophet, or the rabbinic admonition that Jews must survive as Jews, even to find joy after the destruction of the temple, teaching that it is better to, that they should err in ignorance than presumptuously. The burden this places on us in an age of historical consciousness is enormous. Fackenheim would argue, perhaps, that despite how preposterous it may seem to us, we must ourselves prove wrong our suspicions that there is no God and that there is no holiness in the world. He writes, who is a Jew? We have cited the Midrashic answer, one who opposes the idols. Somewhere in the sources, there has got to be a Midrash along such lines as these. Who is a Jew? One who hopes. Perhaps what is permanent in Fackenheim's thought is the secret by which we know what needs to be said at any given moment. And at his moment, it was to remind us that there is a path from the despair of the ashes of the temple to the blessings of the Kiddush. Fackenheim knew there was a path because he could feel joy in the telling of a joke or the odors and tastes of Rose's kitchen enveloping him as he pondered these things. Earlier I used the word counterpoint to describe what Fackenheim understood as the interplay between his personal and intellectual lives, and this was not simply poetic. During my stay, he spent many afternoons listening to classical music, which was dear to him. He 
had spent many hours of his childhood listening to music with his mother, and also would talk, also talking with her about philosophy. And so when I say the counterpoint describes the interplay of Fackenheim's personal and intellectual lives, I mean to point to the childlike joy he took in listening to music and finding or making meaning from it. The listening for the two distinct rhythms of thought coming together in moments of harmony, and the polyphony of the whole reflecting back on one small part. And I bring up Fackenheim's pre-Holocaust childhood for a reason. At the end of his life, he told me he wanted to go home. We were, of course, in Jerusalem, and I didn't know if he meant he wanted to return to Germany or to Toronto, or whether he meant something more metaphorical. That is, if he meant he wanted to return to his childhood, rich with music and philosophy, or to the bosom of his fathers. But I offer two final things that suggest to me that his thought was and remained radically open, not only to the future, but to the full possibilities of the saving and commanding God of the Jews, and to the permanence of certain human questions. As he neared the very end of his life, insofar as he and I related to each other, he was deeply involved in these things. First, as I've hinted at, a little more than a month before he died, he spoke to me at great, great length of Aristotle, specifically the prime mover. And I didn't ask, he just was talking. Strange, perhaps, to think that Fackenheim, who made so great a compromise with modern thought, insofar as he was willing to adopt a deep historical consciousness, would return to Aristotle's myth of how it all began. But it seemed to me he was trying to put it all together. It seemed not enough for him to be only in his one moment in history, or even only part of the trajectory of the moments of history. It seemed he wanted to end by pointing to what is permanent in the human situation, our old questions that arise from our inability to know the whole, or our hope in God's transcendence. This kind of going home, I think, was the conviction that reason might arrive at some things, even as, or maybe I should say if, it remains open to the recognition that there are things that it has never, never, and can never attain. The second thing with which Fackenham was involved at the end of his life was Dylan Thomas's Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night. After I had returned from Israel to the United States, he asked that I send him a copy of the poem so he could read it in his hospital. He had never read the poem before. I had shown it to him that summer, and it moved him deeply. Going home in this sense was returning somewhere he had never been, and yet it felt to him to be expressing something he had always known, as great poems often do. I am hoping in this paper to have pointed sufficiently to the ways in which Fackenheim's openness to what happens in the world, and to the meaning that we, potentially all of us, derive from those things, to bring to life what the Villanelle's repeated line might have meant to him. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Thank you. helped them 
get into the country from Italy where they had a farm and uh, which when they realized what was happening in Europe decided that uh, Italy was no longer going to be a very friendly place. When Emil was 19 years old, having completed his rabbinical studies in Berlin, he was picked up on Kristallnacht by the Nazis and served three months in Sachsenhausen, one of the first concentration camps not far from Berlin. It was then his good fortune to have been adopted by a Scottish family, not an English one, in Aberdeen, and so gained his freedom and began his graduate studies at the University of Aberdeen until he was rounded up again, this time as an en enemy alien by His Majesty the King, and sent to Canada, where he was interned in 1940 with 800 fellow prisoners near Sherbrooke, Quebec. That was his first congregation which he served together with his fellow rabbi, Henry Fischel. I often rode by the deserted camp, which was located in the old rundown railroad repair depot on the banks of the Massawippi River, near Bishop's University. Most of the prisoners were German Jews, with a sprinkling of real Nazi war prisoners. The prisoners were provided with gray suits, which sported a large, red circle on the back of the jacket, the better to target any escapee. This then was the first congregation to which Emil ministered. The Canadian government came to its senses between 1942 and 1943 and decided that the prisoners could be better employed to help the war effort. So Emil was released in early 1942 and ended up in Toronto where he became a graduate student at the U of T. As well as a resident rabbi to the Sowers and Davids, the German Jewish friends of my father on the farm, who had bought the farm in 1939. Soon after his arrival, Emil began to prepare the two, three children on the farm for their confirmations. Frank Sauer had his bar mitzvah on the farm, and of course my father his older sister, Eva Sauer, and Renata David were also confirmed. Emil was much loved and respected, so much so that a very aggressive ram was named after him. I often met Emil, the ram, in the orchard and enjoyed pretending to be a bullfighter while evading Emil's pugnacious charges. Herman Sauer reminded Emil of his father and he was also like a second father to me. In his autobiography, there's one line devoted to Dr. Sauer, but over the Toronto years and Doc's lifetime, Emil visited regularly and never left before he told at least one long, convoluted Jewish joke. For Emil, stories from the Midrash and Jewish jokes were interchangeable. Early in 1954, Emil delivered a series of three lectures in Toronto at the YMHA, which I attended. At this time, I was pursuing an MA in history at the University of Toronto. I had as a thesis subject uh, the um, meeting of Anglican High Church and Low Church in the 19th, in 19th century Toronto. I had been at Bishop's University, where my history professor was a member of the Plymouth Brethren. My first choice for a thesis had been about Bishop Helmut, a converted German Jew from Berlin who founded Huron College, but there was nothing to find as far as archives were concerned. I was very close to Christian conversion. The first lecture at the EY was on Hermann Cohn, followed by Ro Franz Rosenzweig the next evening. The second lecture changed my life. After the poignant account of Rosenzweig's life, I never once again thought seriously about conversion. The third lecture was in Martin Buber. Each lecture was more eloquent than the previous, and the passion with which these lectures were delivered 
shone through each evil. I'm certain that Emil had a similar influence on many young people, whether it was as a rabbi in Toronto or Hamilton, or the many academic years he served at the University of Toronto. I've had the good fortune to have studied with many inspiring professors, but Emil was the only speaker with a charisma that was so transformative. There were two extended families on the homey farm. The ladies were all concerned that Emil was procrastinating about wedding Ellen Simon. He was also a target for many a rabbi to whose congregations he lectured <coughs> or where he officiated. They all knew that Emil was a very eligible bachelor and would propose that he consider one or another very eligible young lady that the rabbi felt would make a fine wife. Well, a bachelor he was going to be. What was he waiting for? Emil's life changed one afternoon at the University of Toronto when a young student arrived. What can I do for you, he asked. Well, you could take me out to dinner, she replied. That was Rose, and I suppose Emil was smitten. I don't know if the farm ladies were still around when Emil married Rose that should have been elated. We are fortunate to have Emil's autobiography, an epitaph to German Judaism, from Halle to Jerusalem. The biography is a wonderful document, but does not bring Emil's personality to center stage, or anyone who knew him in his young years or later will attest. The real vintage Emil Wagenheim comes shining through in an interview on the morning of March 24th, 1985, through the editor of New Traditions. The interview is as vital today as it was 30 years ago. I would like to end this presentation with, two last, with the two last parts of this lengthy interview. The first quotation is a question he asked in answer to the previous question he had been asked. Do you know about Simcha Holzberg? He's a Hasid and a Holocaust survivor. He went to Israel and he prospered. He used to go from kibbutz to another, one kibbutz to another, one shul to another, saying, you're not doing enough to remember the Holocaust. And then came the Six Day War. And with it, all the widows and our orphans. And Simcha Holzberg became the adoptive father of orphans, promising to take care of them until they were married. He's now the adoptive grandparent of over a hundred children. Then in answer to the last question, is there anything you'd like to add? There was this moving response. Just a word about humanism, Marx, who was in many ways a great thinker, was pitiful on religion. He said that the more you give to God, the less you have for yourself, which is why no religious person is really emancipated. This is childish, refuting Marx, my wife quotes from Romeo and Juliet. Juliet says, my bounty is as boundless as the sea. The more I give, the more I have to give. <laughs> this is a great secret of the religious life. If you can't believe in God, fine, but at least accept the reality that religious people loving God plenty to give to their children and everybody else. There isn't just a limited supply of love. Thank you.
Jack Kinsler described uh, many of the works of Edward Alexander. Um, his most recent book is called Jews Against Themselves, and it really is a, a study of contemporary, uh, what I call non-Jewish Jews, taking the term from Isaac Deutscher, who described himself as one. But it's, it's, it's uh, Alexander's latest work touches on the, the world that uh, Sally Zerker described in her paper. But he's written many other things, of course. He's a great student of Victorian literature. Um, he's worked on American culture and in various respects. Uh, and in the last 10, 12 years, Edward Alexander has focused on the um, role of liberalism and the left in North America, particularly in America, um, in relation to the increasingly uh, pro-Palestinian atmosphere on our campuses and elsewhere. He is not well, and uh, his wife is not well, and he had wanted to be here. Uh, he couldn't come, but he asked me if I would read uh, a short paper, which I am privileged to do. It's called A Few Words for the Beth Tikva Conference. Like many other people, I first heard the voice of Emil Fagenheim in 1967, when in a symposium in Judaism magazine entitled, quote, Jewish Values in the Post-Holocaust Future, unquote, he boldly proposed the 614th Commandment. The authentic Jew of today is forbidden to hand Hitler yet another posthumous victory, unquote. Prior to the destruction of European Jewry, Vladimir Jabotinsky, also had insisted that survival precedes definition and that there is no survival which lacks meaning. He wrote to his rival Ben Gurion in 1935, quote, I can vouch for there being a type of Zionist who doesn't care what kind of society our state will have. I am that person. If I were to know that the only way to a state was via socialism, or even that this would only hasten it by a generation, I would welcome it. More than that, give me a religious orthodox state in which I would be forced to eat filter fish all day, and I'll take it. More than that, make it a Yiddish-speaking state, which for me would mean the loss of all the magic in the thing, and if there's no other way to get a Jewish state, I'll take that too. Though he was by no means unwilling to go into combat with the many mean-spirited people, mocked or distorted his 614th commandment, Emil knew that his own life was the most powerful argument against him. He was not a mere scribbler, but a doer. In 1983, he left a very comfortable academic post in Toronto to take, a modest, to take up a modest one in Jerusalem, because he knew that the Jewish future lies there and not in Canada. My first personal encounter with Emil came by telephone in 1973 when I was in Toronto to give one of the main lectures at the Victoria College Centenary Conference organized by John Robeson and Michael Lane on James and John Stuart Mill. Emil had probably become aware of my existence because of an article I'd written on Michael Lerner, whose distortion of the idea of tikkun olam struck Emil, and rightly so, as a modern form Jewish apostasy. Emil had also guessed correctly that my lecture on Mill would touch on what he called secular liberalism's inability to grasp the meaning of the Holocaust. He was among the first to recognize the way in which liberalism, once divorced from all biblical inspiration, would become illiberal and dictatorial and acquire a craving for forbidden fruit and also for its legalization. Sometime after the Fackenheims had moved to Israel, I helped Emil and Rose and little Yossi and their very serious older son David move into number three Al Roy Street in Jerusalem. My wife and I were frequent guests there on Friday nights, which were a unique pleasure because they were not only permeated by especially Jewish warmth, but were also something like a salon in which one could meet such notables as Professor and Mrs. Ben Sion Netanyahu, or some of Emil's colleagues at Hebrew University Institute of Contemporary Jewry. During those evenings, I often thought of the 
famous description in 1976 by another Canadian named Saul Bellow. I would interrupt here that Bellow was well aware of Emil Fagenheim's work. Uh, a famous description in 1976 by another Canadian named Saul Bellow of the typical conversation in such a Jerusalem apartment. Quote, the subject of all this talk is ultimately survival. You sit at a dinner with charming people in a dining room like any other. In the domestic ceremony of past dishes and filled glasses, thoughts of a destructive enemy are hard to grasp. What you do know is that there is one fact of Jewish life unchanged by the creation of a Jewish state. You cannot take your right to live for granted. Nobody understood better than Emil that Jews cannot take the right to live as a natural right. As soon as the gnome-like professor entered the lecture hall, the fourth-year philosophy class in 1965 fell silent. Plainly, the man was deemed formidable. At the same time, he struck me then as scrawny, not a little bit fleshy it was in the movie, wasted in some respects, but above all haunted. The veneration the class afforded him reflected the reputation he had gained in two decades. He was, after all, the luminary at the University of Toronto's internationally acclaimed
Shepherd, in view of the horrific depredations of our century crowned by the Shoah, there are huge question marks above humankind. But concerning God, there is no question whatever. Never forget, he concluded, we do not demythologize God. God demythologizes us as God exposes the groundless myths by which humankind is enthralled. I staggered out of his office. The topic of my philosophy essay all but lost in an astonishment that perdures and continues to keep Fackenheim's name fragrant. Yet more than fragrance is involved, for it is through Fackenheim that I became a scholar and a partner in Jewish-Christian dialogue, and most importantly, through him I was exposed to the lethal error of supersessionism, the notion that the church has superseded Israel or that God's covenant with Israel has been revoked. The one covenant is as irrevocable as circumcision is undoable. As a Christian, I remain a grateful guest of honor in the house of in the course of my undergraduate and graduate study, I heard him speak scores of times in a classroom setting. I also get heard him give a great many public addresses. My wife, however, having heard about him during supper conversations and in several of my sermons, had never heard the man himself. And so in June 1996, on the occasion of his 80th birthday, we worshipped by invitation at Holy Blossom Synagogue preach. At the conclusion of the service, my wife, overwhelmed, was out of her mind, and she couldn't go home. We had to retreat to a nearby restaurant, the Lock, Stock, and Bagel, well, <laughs> while she recovered and regained herself over the next two hours. In the graduate seminar on Hegel, I was a, a graduate student with him as well, Fackenheim was warmer, less formal, but no less demanding. The eight students in the class were assigned weekly readings in Hegel. Week by week, however, one student was to be put on the hot seat, in Abel's words. This student was assigned extra readings because, as Abel reminded us with a twinkle in his eye, it's my job to ask nasty questions, and it's your job to answer them. We prepared for our hot seat session as we prepared for nothing else. On the fated day, Fackenheim, cigar blazing like a deadly cannon, posed his first question. Immediately we recognized it as philosophically profound. And immediately we knew that despite our preparation, we could not answer it. We died. He let the corpse twitch noisily for a minute or two and then commented with gentle understatement, you seem to be having difficulty with the question. Perhaps we should move on to my next question. Never think you can't die twice. <laughs> In the graduate division of the philosophy department, U of T, it was a tradition that the professor hosted a class party once per year. And so one week we were invited to his home with our Hegel text. The party, as it were, there was simply the graduate seminar relocated. I'll be with one significant difference. Each student was given two beers and a cigar. <laughs> Have you ever tried to discuss phenomenology disguises after two beers and a cigar? Everyone here today is aware that Fackenheim was released from Sachsenhausen in May 1939, moved to Aberdeen, Scotland, only to be expelled from the UK when Great Britain declared war on Germany in September. He was sent to Sherbert, Quebec, as our friend said. He and his fellow campmates were upset at having to live behind barbed wire. He told me it was terrible to have to live behind barbed wire. After all, they were victims, refugees, not perpetrators or prisoners of war. Still, officially, they were enemy aliens. With no malice in his heart whatsoever, Fackenheim could speak humorously of his experience in Sherbrooke. One day, a Canadian military officer lined up all the inmates and barked, Even if you are Jews, you still have to wash every day. Next, the detainees were told, We don't want any monkey business. 
Far from sign, far from home said he knew with his high school English what a monkey was and what business was, but he was clueless as to monkey business. The same officer concluded his peroration, you play ball with us and we play ball with you. Play ball was no less mystifying to someone with only high school, non-colloquial, non-idiomatic English. Still, Fackenheim liked to say, despite his non-colloquial English, thereafter he told the other inmates that this nasty, obnoxious officer should be identified as Major Balls. <laughs> his sense of humor never left him. Halfway through even the most serious public address, he would announce, time out for a joke, and relieve the tension his address had engendered without trivializing in any way the point he had been making. Here's one such joke. Now, my wife says none of his jokes are funny, but I think they're funny, okay? There was a frightfully inept rabbi at Montreal whom the congregation wanted to uh, unload, but in order to get rid of him, they knew they had to hype him. And so they said, this man is like Moses. The Montreal congregation said, he's like Socrates. He's even like God himself. Well, a Toronto congregation that was looking for a rabbi called him. Six months later, the Toronto congregation claimed that it was the victim of false advertising. <laughs> Not at all, said the Montrealers. We told you he was like Moses. Moses stuttered, this man stutters. We told you he was like Socrates. Socrates, do you know Hebrew? He knows no Hebrew. <laughs> we told you he was like God. God isn't human and neither is he. <laughs> Emil always liked to tell the story about himself and Anshi Shalom, the congregation in Hamilton he served from the mid to the late 40s. With his theological seriousness and its non-seriousness, he and it were eventually at odds. One day the board summoned him to a meeting, a meeting at which he knew he was going to be fired. One by one, the board members voiced a criticism of his work and concluded by reducing his annual salary by several hundred dollars. The meeting had been underway for a while, each board member speaking in turn, when Fackenheim thought it was time for him to speak up in his own defense. As soon as he began to speak, a board member shouted, Look who's talking! He makes only $3,000 per year. <laughs> he was fired. This anecdote, I think, is important in that everywhere I go, I hear that he was fired from Anshu Shalom because of his marriage to Rose, who was a non-Jew at that time. Let's be clear. He was fired in 1948, but he didn't marry. Immediately, the University of Toronto hired him. Yet Fackenheim was never soured by the experience. He continued to esteem any rabbi who lived with and ministered to a congregation. And after the incident, he taught the confirmation class at Holy Blossom for decades. When Fackenheim preached at major services in Toronto, crowds lined up in a cold autumn rain to be sure of getting a seat. On one of his post-retirement visits to Canada, Fackenheim phoned me and asked me how I was getting along. I replied, perhaps somewhat self-deprecatingly and in a manner I wouldn't use now, I said, oh, I'm a garden variety pastor. Immediately he said, you should be happy in your work. He loved Amcha and he never belittled the people who lacked his formal expertise. Philosophically erudite as he was, Fackenheim nevertheless had little use for apologetics, the notion that God can be argued for and faith people can be argued into. In informal conversation with me, he remarked, why is it that so many Christian apologists argue for the superiority of Christianity by arguing for the inferiority of Judaism? Setting apologetics aside, he moved instead to the point he has made so very tellingly in several books, namely, his appointment as a witness to God's presence in history. In private conversation, Professor Kenneth Green remarked to me once, as often as you were around, 
Emil Falkenheim, you came away wanting to be a better Jew. I always came away wanting to be a better Christian. On Kristallnacht, 9th November 1938, Falkenheim had been arrested and sent to Sachsenhaus in a forced labor camp whose labor was to consume 95% of the men. It wasn't an extermination camp, it was a forced labor camp, but the food was so poor and the labor so forced that 95% of the men perished anyway. He found Ernst Tillich, nephew to Paul Tillich, in the camp, Ernst having been in prison for his opposition to Nazism. Seven weeks later, on Christmas Eve, Fackenheim found Ernst Tillich manifestly depressed. When asked why, Ernst replied, today is Christmas Eve. It's the biggest celebration in the Lutheran church calendar. All day long, I've been thinking about what I would preach to my congregation if I had one. But I don't have one, and therefore I have no one to hear my sermon. I can fix that, Falkenheim rejoined. And promptly he rounded up all the rabbinical students in the camp. Whatever it is you would say to a Lutheran congregation on Christmas Eve, Falkenheim continued, you tell us in Sachsenhausen concerning the one whose mercy endures forever. In yet another of his public addresses in Toronto, Falkenheim was characteristically profound. The question and answer period that followed, however, was shallow. Unable to endure it, I left quietly, went home, and wrote Emil a letter, brief letter, telling him what he had done for me when I was a student at U of T. Six months later, at a dinner party, Falkenheim took me aside and told me he had received my letter and what it had meant to him, fearing not that he hadn't been intellectually helpful, but that he had, had made no life-altering difference to anyone in his four decades of teaching. He had been depressed for several months. When he had received my letter, his depression had lifted. When Fackenheim went home, Sharon, 18th September 2003, I was sitting in my study when I received the news from Jerusalem. I wept as I have never wept in my life. I felt a pillar of the universe had been removed. My wife came home an hour later, asked what on earth had befallen me, and wept with me. And then together we thanked God for the gift that Emil Ludwig Falkenheim was. From him I gained an intellectual rigor I have cherished this day. More profoundly, from him I became aware that it is vocation enough for any man or woman to be appointed a witness. My debt to him is unpayable.
Yes, I think we, um, at some point during the day, back and I'm citing Tanakh, noting that in every generation there is an Amalek. Amalek comes to kill the, the Jews. We're facing, we're facing Amalek again today. We're facing it if it's very real. There's no question of ownership of this. We know to whom ownership belongs. The problem is how to deal with it while remaining true to our own tradition, to our own values. Rabbi Greenberg, I'll give you the last word. Would you like to close? No, I, um, I'm partly responding to the last question. Uh, uh, in that sense, I think one of the, I do think one of the um, miracles uh, of Jewish history, maybe, is the fact that as a Taking ownership means that, you know, the, uh, the opposite of what was said in the question, or it did not mean that, well, this is human, this is all humanity has done this. And I think that taking ownership in, a, in quite a different sense, that the Jewish people responded by turning this into a force, not for demanding revenge or for building up anger and lashing out or justifying. I mean, people like Mayor Kahana did that. They, they tried to the Holocaust as an excuse to inflict pain and suffering on other people in the name of defending Jews. To me, the miracle is that this is a pure hatred, pure evil, pure destructive, and yet it's a kind of an alchemy by a human response, by faith, by, by love. It was turned into a force for, you know, the opposite, or it's a greater humanitarian responsibility for to fight evil greater. So I think that's one of the great accomplishments and of course Emil is certainly part of that. I'm going to say the next comment uh, with some apology because it's very late in the day and I hope it will not come out sounding like a cheap shot which can't be answered. But I, I want to also say that I am struck by the fact and we saw that today in two Christian speakers the extent to which again not just Judaism and Jewry but Christianity is Taken the Holocaust seriously as a as a rebuke, as a recognition of serious flaws that have played a role in this thing, and as a result, I, and I think it's a miracle, has gone through one of the to me one of the most revolutionary self criticisms of any serious religious tradition. I mean, I I, I say this. responsibility of guilt, maybe, but it's become, again, a very positive force for life. Now, can't romanticize. There are lots of Christians who still um, either go on as old or now try to turn the old into a into anti-Israel, anti-Zionism on the cover of that. But all things being equal, I think as Jews we should understand and appreciate the amazing extent to which Christianity has really tried to repent and renew itself cheap shot that I was worried about saying, but I'll say it anyway. I think one of the really classic problems we face now is, of course, Islam and Islam's attitude. In other words, instead of recognizing the Holocaust as the evil that it was, instead of recognizing to the extent to which Mufti and people like that were, in fact, implicated or the hatred which is uh, which is uh, projected by Hamas and so on comes from the Muslim Brotherhood teachings which which people the founders like mine were influenced by Hitler. That was instead of understanding that this is a threat to Islam too and that it has to fight this lest it become implicated in future Holocaust. You had instead denial, Holocaust denial, you had tremendous spread of anti Semitism and uh, protocols of the Zion and which are bestsellers in the Muslim world. And I think that is not a small factor in the fact that the worst, rather the best in Islam, Islam has a better record than Christianity in the Middle Ages sometimes than Jews. But the fact is because of the failure to confront the Holocaust or draw lessons from it, it has been pushed, it's 
defend or answer back, but I think it's a very serious problem and it needs attention. And the, the answer is not to dump, but to continue to try to bring dialogue, serious dialogue to Islam and a serious confrontation with the Holocaust as the to a close. We've thanked a lot of people today. I want to thank all of you sitting uh, in the audience for being a wonderful group, for coming out. Excellent questions, wonderful responses. It's been a fine day for all of us, for Beth Tikva, for Canadian Institute for Jewish Research, and I think uh, my hope is that perhaps we'll see a, a volume of proceedings coming out of this uh, so that we uh, address a larger audience. And the uh, whole conference will be available on the CIJR website, which is at www.israelnet.org shortly. Thank you all very much for that. Hello, my name is Ari. I'm a PhD candidate in international relations at UCLA, but I live in Toronto where I'm writing my dissertation. I had the great privilege of being invited and included uh, in the audience in your conference today about the thoughts, philosophy, and legacy of Emil Backenheim. Uh, I learned immensely from each one of the panelists and each one of the lectures. Uh, I sincerely hope that such lectures will continue to take place in the future. I gained in some of the following ways in a specific manner. One, it was just such a privilege to be in the same room with so many open-minded, thoughtful, well-read, and learned Jewish and non-Jewish people alike sharing in a discussion of learning and listening one to another that's so rare. As beautiful as this conference was and as this gathering was, I think it's only the tip of the iceberg of the kind of discourse and learning that needs to take place, not only among those of us who are together today, but from synagogue to synagogue, home to home, and in classrooms all over. Um, the depth of moral insight that the speakers today were offering in their lectures, as well as what everybody was learning and absorbing simply by listening to what was said, is such a voice of conscience in a world that is so pragmatic and so, whether security oriented or headline oriented or uh, business oriented or attention span deficit oriented um, when it comes to thinking about very deep problems that face the Jewish nation today, the Jewish nation historically, that are posed by Jewish texts and that are posed in the world before us, uh, the world of the headlines. I think the teachings of Emil Fackenheim that were disseminated today, I think that their relevance is just doubly obvious in light of the insights that everybody shared and learned, and I hope that this would be a small step to continuing dialogue about the importance of the Holocaust in the year 2015, and continuing the important cause of taking the moral lessons of the Holocaust, which is, in a sense, what we can all imbibe into our homes and into our hearts, we can all take something away and teach something new to somebody else, start a conversation with somebody new, read a new book, uh, go to a new uh, uh, library and expand our curiosity. And if we do this, we'll do one small thing to continue the memory of the Shoah and expand the moral deliberation that it poses to all of us. And I think that's what Emil Fackenheim's life and legacy were about, and if he were here, he would have been elated to see the Holocaust and its moral problems still being of distinct relevance to all of us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much.